Good evening. An illustrious curtain will be drawn this weekend on the reign of Fiona Wall, the president of the Uganda Law Society. Fiona Wall voted to the helm in 2020, ascended the leadership of Uganda Law Society from a background that wasn't the native career practice, but has proved in her years to be an instrumental addition to the society, growing it from its principal interest in the rule of law to a business and corporate body too. Tonight on the spot, we put her to task. On the rain, we questioned the future she envisioned for the law society and the challenges that have dodged her path. On the spot tonight is Fiona Wall, the president of the Uganda Law Society. Fiona Navasa War. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Patrick. It's we are an so honor humbled that you accepted our invitation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I remember it is how time flies when you were voted into office as president of Uganda Law Society. And we can't imagine that you have done your, you've done your race. It didn't fly, Patrick. It, 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 there's it, moments that it really I know, dragged. because of the COVID and all the kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah, it did. But, yes. but uh, maybe we still needed you more in the Uganda Law Society <laughs> as president. No. But before we actually look into the rain hmm. at the helm of your office, hmm. Uganda Law Society, the world is mourning oh, yeah. the end of such an illustrious career, the end of an era Mm. and probably the beginning of another. I'm talking yes. about the death of Queen Elizabeth. Yes. Um, it has just occurred about two, year, two, 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 two hours ago. Mm. What a rain it has been. It's been amazing, morning. 70 years. I don't know how many terms that would be for a British pre Prime Minister. She has actually seen 14, 15, 15 Prime Ministers, Prime come, ministers and yes. come and go. Some ignored her. But I think for me the most amazing thing about this is that uh, she was the most private person and then the most public person at the same time i think i loved that i loved her grace and i loved her i am soft spoken so when you're a young girl growing up and uh, the the definition of a female lawyer is someone very aggressive with a very aggressive voice you kind of like it when there is a queen in england that is so soft spoken but she's still also a woman of steel. <laughs> and you know, to be able to be at the helm for 70 years and, wow. avoid, and avoid scandals? I've been here two years and I have gray hair and I don't recognize myself. It's amazing. It's an amazing legacy. Um, as a teenager, I wasn't always enamored of her. I remember when Princess Diana died, we were all very emotional and we really judged her. But when you grow older, you start to appreciate certain things. And I think the one thing I appreciate the most about her was her 70 years was years of service. She literally sacrificed her life for the people of England. And she promised it when she was just a 20 year old. And, 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 and actually she served until maybe two days ago when she was handing over when she was uh, uh, accepting Liz Trust to, yes. to, to, to form a government as Prime Minister. Yes, but you must also understand, I think I'll say it from a human perspective, that her best friend and her long life companion passed just recently. It's very hard to, to spend 73 years with somebody and they leave. And I think, um, I think she figured it was time. There's been many signs. Do you think the, the the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth will be the same without this look like this lady Absolutely was like the glue? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, I think she is the last of her kind. I think with her we're going to actually see the turn, first of all, in, in, in the kind of leadership. The monarchy is going to have a completely different face. Uh, we've had scandals. Um, We've had interesting stories, we've had abdications, we've had, although even she experienced one, uh, her uncle abdicated, that's how her father became king. That's how her so father came into the line. Exactly, mm -hmm. so I think there are many things that are not new, but I think Queen Elizabeth provided a stability a stability throughout the ages, throughout the generations. And it was very funny that she seemed to actually catch up even with the fourth industrial revolution. It, it's, it's extremely 
I, I don't know a grandmother or a great grandmother that would be like her age that would attend 400 functions on her 70th, uh, her diamond anniversary. Her and, and, and you know that, that when you look and 400 read functions oh in God. one year. Oh my God. She That's was an she was someone to reckon with. And, and the, when you read the British uh, press, it looks like they are not warming up for Prince Charles, who is now King Charles III. <laughs> Can I say something? Yes. It's not every day that you get someone like Queen Elizabeth and it's going to be another 70 years before we forget her. So uh, that will take, I don't know how many kings, queens, princes, uh, before we forget who Elizabeth who was. So I mean, she, she saw us through crucial times. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, colonization, <laughs> the colonization of Africa happened. The transition happened the whole time. In, in her, in her Not time. Not only had that transition, but uh, 1952, getting independence, that that was powerful. 1962. In 1962. For us. I think she took over in, in, 19, in the 1950s, in, yes. In the 50s. So when you come to 62, 263 this independence and now we're coming to the African Union and then we're coming to the CFTA and all these things are happening with her. I mean Chogam was in Rwanda the other day and there was so much that you could not have anticipated and um, I think COVID COVID changed the pace of technology, the pace of the growth of the world. Uh, as it a, put it in overdrive. Yes, eh? <laughs> and, and made it the global village we'd always anticipated. So I think she saw it all. I think she's seen it all. And I bid her farewell. And I really think that she's one of those people who God will say, well done, my good and humble servant. But uh, uh, Meghan Merkel threw in a spanner in, in the whole uh, royalty. That wasn't new. <laughs> <laughs> Diana did the same. The Queen's children are all divorced or separated or something. Meghan did not really, um, as I said, uh, Elizabeth's uncle abdicated and that's how we ended up having Elizabeth as Queen. So some things happen for good mm -hmm. yeah yeah and there she was and, and you know attending every function there at the balcony of Buckingham, Buckingham Palace. I like how the Queen is there and they're saying two years at the helm of world's leadership. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> but um, the amazing thing with her was her beauty. She was flawless, she was edgeless okay. and she was a paragon of fashion. Oh yeah. Yeah as a woman you look at all her hearts throughout the years. You look at her colors, um, her love of style. I always imagined she was the one supervising the way the photographs were taken. All the family photographs are the let me, same. Let me explain because <laughs> we have a lower third that is misleading with the pictures. Uh -huh. The pictures, the images are of the co of, yes, of, of, the, of the queen. Yes, please. That's, that's not <laughs> and the lower <laughs> third is about what we're going to get into. Uh, so I hope that is not, uh, I hope that's understood. By the way, yeah. Mr. Producer should have changed that because yeah. the lower third is not telling the story. We thought we should uh, maybe digress a little bit as we begin because it's important thank the world you. is mourning thank you for letting us remember her <laughs> yeah the world yes. is mourning such a great iconic leader yes. that has passed on i had an opportunity to see her from a few meters away when mm. she came from oh, Chogham. yes it was wow. i could see you know the glamour and the glees that yeah. when she reached that entebbe uh, airport and <laughs> was driven to a uh, set house in tebe and i'm there with my little camera trying to capture the images because history was being made she's you know Uganda. patrick the only glimpse I've ever seen of Queen Elizabeth's humor were letters that were quoted in the Daily Monitor some time back uh, from her between her and 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 uh, President Idi Amin and he I think he sent her very humorous she was very concerned about how he was running the country and uh, he sent her you know a consoling message and told her not to be very concerned and said he was beginning a fund because uh, Britain was going through a crisis a financial crisis mm -hmm. and um, I, I just loved the humor in those letters I think they were they were probably good friends surprising right maybe they were I don't and know whether there are many people who are, who are underrated Idi Amin, but uh, when you look back with the hindsight of history and you see things he did and maybe you're like, okay, maybe, that she maybe, wrote, maybe it was too much vilified, but perhaps he wasn't a buffoon. I, I saw quite a was. sense of humor in their, in their exchanges. exchanges, which reflected different sides of them than, than what we know. <laughs>
All right, and, and, and maybe the Commonwealth and, and the, the, the countries under her in some way have still survived get becoming a republic in her time. I remember Australia was voting to become a republic, but somehow the monarchists survived by uh, Whisker and so I other think countries. I has, has been the most um, preserved monarchy. I think most of the others are, fight, are struggling to, to remain relevant. And I think even during her time, there were many threats to the existence of the monarchy. That's why I said I think she contributed a lot to the stability of the monarchy throughout the decade. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, um, so now, Fiona Wall, yes. President of Uganda Law Society, your term is coming to an end. What a rain has it been like <laughs> for the last two years? I feel like I should just talk about the 70 years. <laughs> the two years seems like nothing. But for me, it's been a, like a lifetime of lessons, a lifetime of blessings, a lifetime of struggles. Um, the thing with leadership is that sometimes your greatest enemy is the woman in the mirror. When you look at yourself, yeah, leadership and you're scared is like, of you. Leadership you're scared of you. It's like alcohol, it's like power. It brings out the worst and the best in you. So sometimes someone comes out in the mirror that you don't recognize. Um, it's also a time to confront your weaknesses. It's a time to, to, to sacrifice. I think there's no leadership without sacrifice and that can be really hard especially when you have to force your loved ones to sacrifice for the for, for what you're doing you know you came to the leadership of Uganda Law Society at a very challenging time okay. than most of the your predecessors because yes. this is a time also when we have an election that was like no other mm -hmm. and uh, when we have COVID. also COVID-19 and the lockdown and, and, and all those issues had to do with a lot of uh, injustices that were happening, yes. you know, human rights violations, and mm. that, yet, yet there you are, you're supposed to be the torchbearer and to shed a light on what is happening and perhaps stop them. Mm. How challenging was it on your side as president of a law society in these times? I think nobody's ever prepared mm. to face things like that, especially when you are going to be the president of a professional association, you make so many assumptions. And not just an association, association of lawyers. Yes, I had been secretary, I had been vice president, and I really thought um, that the, the, the biggest wars would probably be maybe about around rule of law, but in a different way. But now we had to deal with the lockdown brought in very special issues. Uh, the courts were closed. Mm -hmm. Uh, so first of all, one of our first battles was to get the courts open, was to get our lawyers to get access to their, their clients in the prisons. You know, the prisons were locked off. But then there's also the issue of movement. You know, when you are declared non-essential as a whole uh, a, a whole profession that's that's really alarming especially when arrests are going on and prisons are overflowing uh, we had another peculiarity there that we did not expect was the arrest of our advocates um, those first three months of my presidency had the arrest of about five advocates and uh, this was not normal arrests they would be kidnapped uh, taken away, no due process, they'll be disappeared. Now what happened I think uh, then was that there was, um, there was an outcry because it was too much. Uh, these people were not just being arrested because they committed crimes or whatever, they were being, uh, some, some of them were being arrested because of the, they were in the course of their work. So this was a threat to every advocate mm -hmm. that you do not know when someone is going to pick you up because of the kind of work and that you do. How did doing. you go about this? Well, um, I am a woman and yeah. I, I have kids and I, I can be quite the coward and so I believe in moving as a group. <laughs> So the first thing we we had to do was shine the light on what is happening. We had to communicate to the membership. So we introduced these flyers just saying, happening now. They've just taken so and so and this is what is happening. Oh, I remember when you almost summoned like 50 lawyers at CPS to rescue just one of them. I'll explain. <laughs> How did I you think do for that? me that, that was not summoning. So <laughs> we kept communicating to everybody because we did not know 
whether any of us would also be picked up in those issues. It was a very scary time for us. It was unprecedented. So one would communicate. Two, we, we tried dialogue. Uh, being somebody who also works in government, I did try. Mm -hmm. We did try dialogue. But when dialogue would fail, we would go to the fourth estate. Thank you, <laughs> thank you to the fourth estate, and then. Um, and, and, and then we'd agitate. We even had an EG, an extraordinary general meeting on how to protect our lawyers. And uh, there, there were so many interesting things that came out of that conversation. And one of those was we are suffering because of the divisions within the law society. Okay. We had lawyers working in government like you know me we had lawyers working in the state um, state attorney's office but we also had lawyers in private practice NGOs CS and some of these lawyers were behind the arrests of the other lawyers so we said no 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 we're going to be one one of the most important resolutions in that Wait place. a minute some of the lawyers were behind the yes, arrest, and the we, arrest of their yes, colleagues yes so we said one that's, of the, that's a big statement yes, so we made a resolution and said if any lawyer does is is seen to to have done this we will we will take action and I think that helped sort of unite us and then and then you know I think it was kind of alarming for all these lawyers to see their their little president going alone to so the first time I remember going to CPS to look for Ambrose Teviasa yes, Ambrose. and I found fifth like 55 lawyers there. What? 55 lawyers Standing at CPS? There. Uh, you, let Operation me explain that situation. <laughs> you know, we had been looking for Ambrose. I had been talking. They kept moving him from place to place. I had gone to, you know, the anti-corruption unit, seen him then. So by the time he was at CPS, I had uh, an application. I was going to Uganda Road Court to apply for his release. Uh, but I, I told the driver, let's just stop by CPS, because that's where he is. And someone had just called me and said, you know, they're not even letting us see him. So I just stopped by CPS to see him. And I had this, these papers in my hands to go and file. And then I see these lawyers and they're screaming, Madam President. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, we have a riot on our hands. And then Ambrose comes out. Okay. He comes out. Without the... the you know, he's a senior bail, lawyer. Was bail, he, no, no, he's a senior lawyer, out. but he no, he just been released, and he just came down the stairs between the lawyers, and and it was a very emotional moment for me. And he came and gave me a big hug, and all the lawyers were just jubilating, and I I was very happy and I was very embarrassed because I think I was emotional and I was thinking the lawyers so, don't want an emotional president but that moment for me was the moment that lawyers began to think of themselves as us and working not together. me yes and it set a precedent because the next time when we went to see Nicolas Opio we had they were about almost of chapter four <laughs> almost 150 lawyers there. There were different sections of lawyers. There were lawyers in government, lawyers, everybody was there. The court was overflowing when we went to see Nicholas's bail application. So I think that for me that was one of the greatest, um, most beautiful moments. Yes, whereas you, are able, whereas you are able, you are able to bring them together mm -hmm. in some way to follow their leader and tr in trying to to call for the I think the of circumstances their colleagues. Brought them. <laughs> that pressure needs to be brought to bear to yes. the government itself. Sometimes not even to do what they do. Because you do not have to, uh, you know, call your colleagues and rest you. They should just know it's not a, it's a, it's a wrong business. So Patrick, to that's get another in. win that I, I will boast of. Because what happened is that because it became a concerted effort, even even government lawyers, even they joined us in the struggle. And what came out is that now there's no lawyer that's arrested after I think there's no lawyer now that is arrested without the Uganda Law Society being informed, without them having a lawyer. We created a helpline for lawyers. We even put up a task force to protect human rights defenders. But now, let's look into so, 2020. So for me, I think that that has, that has changed, at least uh, for the legal profession. And uh, later on, after the elections, when, when they started arresting human rights defenders, we employed the same You, you seem to have tried and, and, and pulled it off to defend the defenders. But I'm talking mm. about the defenseless now. Oh, the defenseless. The defenseless, yes. uh, mm. you know, those who have no voice. You know, in, yes. during the campaigns in 2020 mm. to the 2021 election, quite mm. a number of people were arrested, picked on yeah. the streets. You have heard of the drone, of, of, the, of, the, of the drones yes. and, and all these, you know. So, so, so 
how was your presidency impactful on the guy on the street who has a different political view and yes. then he finds maybe abducted by state apparatus? Yes, so the first thing that happened was the November shootings. Yes. So after the November shootings, we had a meeting. We, we released a, a rule of law report about what had happened. Uh, we do, we release quarterly rule of law reports where we name and shame, we praise, but we, we also use those opportunities to engage with the state actors and, and work on our way forward. So we released that report on 22nd December and one of the things, one of the conclusions we made in that was that something had to give, we had to do something different for this Muntua Wansi that had been arrested. Uh, there had been many disappearances at that time. So what we did was we launched a, a hundred man task force, a hundred lawyer task force all over the country on December 22nd, 2020. And we launched this task force to rescue, to help, to assist any Ugandan that would be arrested, detained or disappeared in a way that did not follow the law in that time. And you know we already have 23 legal aid clinics that were working. We had uh, about 1,500 pro bono lawyers that had availed themselves for pro bono services but we put upside these 100 lawyers specifically to do this work and we have a report that we released on, on our website. I remember between January and March 2021 we were able to actually uh, rescue 103 of, of, of the 170 that the Minister of Internal Affairs talked about and um, I, I think another thing that was interesting in that time is we were able to do election observation at a time and 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 it was funny that there were a lot of CS, civil society organizations that had been accredited to observe elections but they were banned from um, actually doing it and some were arrested if you remember so we also were able to help some of those that were arrested but were also able to produce a report uh, from about 63 Uganda Law Society election observers that we launched in March so for the Muntu Wawansi, um, we created that task force and after that we kept it as a rolling task force. I think you've seen us appear even with the Segelinias, even with the, um, apart from just, you know, making statements and, and going to parliament and advocating for, for these people to be represented, to be for due process. Okay. We've seen that. But, but you know, we see the violation of human rights. For example, if you look at yes. the, you read a report for, of the Uganda Human Rights Commission, which is an agency of government, it indicts the government itself in mm -hmm. the violation of these rights. And, and, yes. and when you look at the report of 20, 2020 or 2019, they're always the same. These things keep happening again and again yet we you, we seem mm. to see you being vibrant but that's not reflected in the behavior of government what needs to be done you recommend you are vibrant you're seen when your colleagues are arrested you are there you, within minutes but this there seems to be adamant in continuing to do what Patrick, they do in a, in a in a in a functioning democracy we should not be running after our lawyers we should not be the law society should be we have four mandates as a law society to advise government, to fight for the rule of law, to to increase access to justice and to the professional development of our members. It's a lot of work, but I do not think that um, the law society or any other organization should spend the amount of resources we spend trying to remind um, state uh, state actors to, to follow the law, to follow the constitution in a democracy. I think that that's the problem that we're dealing with. But I'll say that uh, one of the things that that I would say, some of the changes, maybe I can, mm -hmm. is, is we did call out uh, the, the shootings, we did call for compensation, Let me ask, I, we did I, I, talk about torture. Are they shootings or the killings? Or, 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 the killings, or, or, they the were killings. killings. Or, they were or, killings, or the but when I say shootings, is there were people that were also wounded, mm -hmm. you see. There were people who were murdered, there were people who were wounded. But what I'm saying is, uh, when we came out of that, 
there was also an ugly thing that came out, torture. Mm -hmm. Torture became a real thing over and over again. And um, so one of the things that came out is we challenged the forces and said, you know, we, we, you keep saying you're disciplined, but we're not seeing the discipline. We need to see, we need to see discipline here. And, and then we also said you need to do, follow due process, uh, prote protect the rights of even detained people, suspects. And then in the middle of interacting with them, we said, okay, we shall train you first because we keep calling you out on these things, but maybe we're making assumptions that you know the law. So I'm glad to say, Patrick, that right now we've done about uh, two trainings for the UPDF and, and two trainings for CID officers. But, uh, you, and, do you and sometimes think that those it, conversations, these hopeful. things are happening mm -hmm. because in their training manuals they are lacking ABCD? No, 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 I, I, I don't believe in training manuals. Oh, okay, we lie somewhere is, collecting dust. Yes. I think that first of all, we got a very good law called the Human Rights Enforcement Act that woke everybody up. Mm -hmm. Because what that act says is that if in the, in the, in the pursuance of a prosecution, uh, it comes out in court that this, this prosecution was procured through illegalities like torture and, and things like that, then this prosecution needs to be halted, that needs to be dealt with, and then the veil can be lifted and people can be tried personally for for, indul for indulging officers can be tried so as the law society we did a colloquium on this and tried to educate all the jailers actors especially the security agencies and we also uh, but has it that been always the case that any evidence mm -hmm. gotten from a suspect through it's illegal it is yes. illegal but so we, why did you have to have an act because we had court sometimes ignoring this we had some judicial officers ignoring this we had um, then you, you create a you law see, on another see, Patrick, law that problem already that this an existing country, law. Yes, the problem this country has is not laws. We have very good laws, but we also we need enforcement. We need implementation. That's of why I'm the saying, laws. Madam yes. President, to all yes. society, that you shouldn't even have gone to create another act. You just enforce what is available. No, you see, when when uh, an officer would appear in court, they would say, "I was under orders." And then you see if they say they were under orders, it's very hard to find who ordered them. And then what that does then, you cannot arrest the whole institution. So we said, no, 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 we have to create criminal liability for this behavior. We have to remove the, the veneer of officialism that these people are hiding under. So you're talking about making an example of Taking somebody. people at a personal level. Exactly. Holding them personally responsible. Exactly. The problem with that is, if they are if they are found culpable in this issue and then there are matters to do with with the, you know paying maybe compensation then there's nothing much you can get from this individual no 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 you might not look for compensation but i'm telling you patrick if uh, if if um if a senior officer goes to jail for torture if he is prosecuted if he's given a sentence um, it sends chilling. Are there examples where this law has been able to bite? That's, now that has been the problem because we are on record as a law society. Two, three, four times we made calls, we provided uh, lines and we said give us evidence because there were, um, there were fo people who were photographed shooting, there were people who were, to who, who were accused of torture, but people didn't come forward. And, and that's, that, that's why I said that this country, we need um, some serious mindset change. The people who are f afraid, they're wrapped up in fear and they will not even try. The people who are apathetic, they might even have the information, but they're like, ah, nobody will do. Even if we call somebody and give the information, nobody will do anything about it. Then there are people who are just corrupted, that they have power, they're sitting on, on, on power. They could solve these problems and they're not using that power. So all three groups, all of us, we need a mindset change. And that's why, uh, our efforts are not futile. We're chipping away. We're chipping away at this cancer. We're chipping away. When, when, when Human Rights Commission does this, when, and the sad thing was that when, we became, when I became president, Human Rights Commission had not had a, a head for a whole year. They had backlog. Yes. Uh, they, there, was the no IGG, there was no substantive. There was no substantive IGG. All the governance institutions were, 
were, were almost inoperative. So the backlog of human rights um, cases and things like that was also insurmountable. And then the lockdown came and increased it. So in this environment, I'm, I'm just describing this mm -hmm. environment, where we're struggling to keep up with the justice needs of the society. And then we have a very apathetic leadership sometimes. And then we have a very, and when I say leadership, I meant at that point, we did not see parliament coming out to call out on this, to call out these issues, to ensure that the victims are compensated, to ensure that someone is answerable for this. We do not see anybody being prosecuted because of the killings, for instance, you know, in November. You know, you know, whereas you're supposed to shed a light on what is happening, mm. I, I can also say in your reign, mm. we saw a spike of violation of human rights. Absolutely. And, and, and yet, people should have maybe gotten scared. There's Madam President who is watching <laughs> you, who's make, going to make recommendations and, 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 and shed a light for all Ugandans to see. Actually, even you, being a um, your, your deputy was a female, yeah. you're a female, and that was the first. Yeah. But guess what? Under the lockdown, there was, you know, a spike of gender-based violence. Exactly. Uh, torture and in you their know, homes, Patrick, you see that's rape and the, defilement. That's the thing. Um, and, and, and yet we expected you to be the voice so that some of these people who were maybe trying to do, mm -hmm. to violate the rights of, of women, and women and girls could, could go slow. You see, but they did. They, Exactly, and and I'll say this: we have a rule of law symposium annually. The last two rule of law symposia were about the, the what happened, the rape, the defilement of these girls. We had about thirty-eight thousand girls in just the first three months. This we released a report on this. We put we we spoke to all the actors on this. We actually wanted to start prosecutions. Our legal aid clinics were opened up and, and, and we, we, we had lawyers going to people's homes to get evidence and everything. But the saddest thing, Patrick, is that these are the breadwinners of the families. These are the, and nobody would want to even give you evidence. It's so sad that uh, in a time when the president of the law society, the speaker of parliament, the a female. The vice this is president. happening. The vice president. This is happening. Uganda is such a country of contradictions. I think we have one of the best con cons uh, constitutions in the world when it comes to gender issues. We have uh, serious gender programs. I mean, parliament has this certificate, this gender certificate that all recruitments have to pass. But at the same time, it's the country where um, children are not safe, girls are not safe from their fathers. So this is not something that one person can can do we're toothless we don't have an army we don't we can't put you know but what we have is a war room which is a courtroom what we have is um an audience and and we've tried to voice I, I, these I don't things know, out i don't know even if you are able to take a case let's say of defilement or yes. rape into court what happens in court with, again, lawyers like you, yes. I mean, in cross-examining the witnesses, you know, they can make the victims relieve the trauma. Exactly. But Patrick, I, that has I've changed seen. a lot. We've, mm -hmm. we've done a lot of trainings. I'll say that the Law Society has done a lot of trainings uh, on, on the sensitivity of victims, on how to examine these victims. The judiciary has done a lot, and I want to applaud them for that. These days, uh, victims of such offenses are actually protected. They are closed sessions. Uh, there are special ways that they're being interviewed. Um, in fact, uh, even when even when we have uh, these these cases of defilement, and we've we've had special sessions now for the first time, the the courts have done special sessions just for SGBV cases. Uh, so th that is changing. But That's when I can but say. But even before it goes, even before even to goes to court, yeah. th there is a police form called the police form. The form oh yeah. Form three. <laughs> But we've engaged with the police. Po po form that three? form has actually been changed. Oh, it has been changed. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, I know what you're talking about. Okay, Fiona War. We're going to. But that's. But it's a man's world. I still say, this country, we've got to change a lot of things. Fiona War. We're going to take a break, and on the spot, we'll be right back.
Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guest tonight is Fiona Wall, the president of the Uganda Law Society, who has run her time and she's about to hand over the baton to somebody else who's coming into office. By the way, the campaign is on now and I'm sure yes. as, as Madam President of the Society, I'm sure you have your own choice, don't you? <laughs> Well, it's my right, isn't yes. it? So have you made it known? No, absolutely Why not. Why not? <laughs> it's a right. Out of respect for the candidates mm -hmm. and the uh, Uganda Law Society members, I, I believe uh, they chose me. I believe they will choose somebody else that is right for this society. Okay. Um, you know, I just want to refresh your mind. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, take you back <laughs> at that time when you just become president of the law society. Yeah. The things you said yes. on, on justice, on government. Yes. Let, let, me, let me ask my producer to dig deep into the archives oh, and, wow. <laughs> and bring me, um, uh, you know, Fiona War on that day when she was full of energy <laughs> to take on the presidency of the law society. And, 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 and this is what she promised oh on justice. <laughs> We have a duty to increase access to justice, to speak for those that do not have a voice. That is why I'm proud to say that despite having 2,000 lawyers as in, in, in the pro bono and legal aid project, we have we are now going to ensure that lawyers, the defenders of defenders, are going to be the ones um, benefiting first from those services to ensure that we strengthen our lawyers when they are doing the right thing of defending those that are defenseless. Um, So, you've done that? Yes, I've just talked about it. <laughs> we have a task force for defending defenders, the human rights defenders. Uh, but also, I think that um, at that point, so funny. I was just mentioning, I can't even believe that's what I said then. Yeah, that's what you because said. Because it happened in yeah, the be, next three I'm months going to give after you another, that. I'm going to give you another surprise. Oh. I don't know whether this is going to be a pleasant <laughs> surprise or not. But okay. uh, on government, this is what yeah. Fiona Wall said then. Yeah. <laughs> we have already been strategic. At the beginning of this year, we took uh, uh, the parliament to court uh, over the Judiciary Administration Bill and we were successful and because of that now that has been passed um, right now we we don't have public smoking uh, allowed because of public interest litigation that was done by uh, those that came before us so this is a, a real tool that that all the arms of government respect so it's high time we used it we are the lawyers yes. so it's just time to take our place to organize strategize and ensure that we use this strategic litigation to get the things on the table that they've refused to put on the table. Um, Public interest litigation. Yeah, but you yes. see, there's a problem there. I've, I've actually seen something that worries me. I don't yes. know whether... Um, and this, okay, I'm trying to stretch this more. Yes. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen a letter written by Lady Justice Kisachi. Yes. Um, uh, in response uh, to a letter to the, written yes. to her, Mm -hmm. by the the peers yes. yes. and, and it looks like is, is this an issue of uh, malfunctioning of, of corporate governance or maybe serious judicial problems in there when you see the peers more or less fighting with the uh, you know justice of the, the high court I, I think i think it could be it could be an issue also of the roles um, as law society, what we've been saying, because we have been quite, we've been speaking in the media about this issue, one, both are established by the Constitution of Uganda, mm -hmm. uh, the 1995 Constitution. Both are, uh, are amplified in their roles by the by the Judiciary Administration Act, which I was excited about however we need to realize that the administrative role of the permanent secretary uh, while, while it's being while, while it's being established and administered and he's carrying out his work needs to be done in a way that does not infringe on the constitutionally established independence of the judiciary and that is why the judicial service commission was established to deal with anything to do with the performance of, of, of the judiciary anything to do with hiring and firing and uh, the issue of um, supervision is handled by the Chief Justice under the Judiciary Administration Act. So what I see is probably 
conflict that might be arising out of a misunderstanding of the roles. But at any one time... In I thought Pius Bijirimana is talking about matters to do with the administration. He is and, talking and that about is, matters And is within with his, his docket to do that, I yes, suppose. Yes, Because if uh, the ministry is uh, money is going through him then there should be accountability for that money he is he's not talking about he matters is an accounting of, he's not officer. talking about matters that are judicial is he he is talking about performance issues he is talking he's about asking for accountability for the money given uh well first of all i will put a disclaimer here we're talking about two letters that appeared in yes. the press We've not had verification from both parties yeah, you're protecting yourself. on whether you're no. Really okay. I'm being I'm being honest <laughs> yeah. uh, because I'm not comfortable talking about things that I haven't verified the sources of. But if we assume that those letters are actually from those sources, you will see that that letter is not only talking about his administrative role. It's 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 talking about you've not performed. You've been out of office for a long time. It has come to my attention. Etc. Etc. I would hope, and I hope maybe that that's the process behind it, that uh, the supervisor of, of, of the justice, it, because ordinarily under the Constitution and the Judiciary Administration Act, the supervisor, if dissatisfied, would, would give the justice a chance to answer In this case, who is the supervisor? The Chief Justice. And if that fails and there's an issue of, of, of uh, non-performance, then you send this issue to Judicial Service Commission. Then there's a whole process. What's the role of the principal judge? I thought maybe also he could do um, or the register. At Supreme Court, okay. they report to the Chief Justice. Okay. Yeah, so when you go to the, to the, to the Judicial Service Commission, this everybody deserves a hearing this is a this is a human right it's it's a labor right so that after that hearing then i think that is when uh financial decisions are made y you understand what i mean if if there's a, if if there's a process of suspending salaries and everything this would just be information it would be i i don't know i would have hoped that the letter you would know. say there's been a process mm -hmm. and because of this process be where 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 you are given a chance to have a hearing and this has happened this would be but also i want to 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 say that th what bothers me the most about this is that these two letters have shown up in the media you know what, what because also, what if amazes it was just what, a simple administrative what amaze, what issue what in the judiciary it would have been dealt with probably better what faster what amazed me yeah. is that now that you're saying the supervisor is the chief justice maybe the best move would have been for Justice Kisachi to ignore. Not, don't it, give him a response. That's what you heard what I said. I said that I think that this issue should have been dealt with. For me, the letters are indicative that um, probably there's a, there's a problem in communication. No, the, 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 the response of uh, Lady Justice Kisachi yes. talks over which hand? The response <laughs> also talks about how she's academically uh, let's call it the alleged <laughs> <laughs> the, the alleged response yeah. talks of a witch hunt yeah. and uh, the alleged response talks about how i have a phd and stuff like that i'm wondering um, was that that was not necessary was it patrick <laughs> um i will or, or say if there is a witch hunt <laughs> then there's the road there's general brokenness in the whole system there is there's been issues and and as the law society we have been engaging with the judiciary using our senior counsel uh, that's all i'll say about that process but i think we need to realize that there's something bigger than all of us here and that is the sanctity of the judiciary we need to preserve the independence of the judiciary we need to imp to preserve the good name of the judiciary because if we denigrate the, the the name of the judiciary through these fights and all these things or bringing these things into the media or and that is why i'm even uncomfortable talking about it here it it it, it breaks down the, the respect that any ordinary citizen, the Muntuwa Wansi, who needs the judiciary to be the place they go to for justice, uh, it, it, it will undermine their respect for this institution. And we need this institution to be respected because for a long time we have said, you know, government doesn't respect court orders, parliamentarians are refusing to show up in court, things like that, because we wanted our leaders to set a good example. We wanted the other arms of government to respect us. So my call as as present law society in my probably last day would be that let 
all people, including the members in the judiciary, uh, whether the executive members in the judiciary or the, 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 the judicial officers themselves, um, conduct everything knowing that, well knowing that uh, it is the, the, the best interest of the judiciary that we need to keep. Uh, because right now, we might see this as a fight between two people or a, or a disagreement between two people, but it has a huge impact on the name of the judiciary, on the independence of judicial officers. It sets a very bad precedent uh, because tomorrow you don't know which judicial officer might get treated in the same way. You know, so you, I think you know what we need makes to, matters worse. Yes. Um, and yes, I know you just <laughs> You're want. You're really to, onto this. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, yeah, because there's a history to Lady Justice Kisachi. You remember during the presidential petition. Yeah. And, and she was having, uh, you know, a diverging or, or, or uh, you know, uh, which is no more ruling on the matter. Yes, but it created an acrimony. Exactly, almost even denying her the, the opportunity to speak out. Yes, but because again, she had a different, she had a different ruling. Again, it was the way that it was conducted. You see, it is absolutely no more to disagree. It's no more. In fact, dissenting, many dissenting judgments have been the source. Lord Denning is famous for dissenting judgments. But um, how these things are handled is very important. And somebody said that too much is given, much is expected. Uh, I believe that this is a lesson for all of us, that when we are exercising power, at that level we need to someone said greatness is power in control we need to exercise our power with we, we need to control our power we need to realize that we hold this power in trust for the people of uganda and i know that it's very tempting to mm -hmm. to get our egos and our personalities in the mix and and then it gets unfortunate but even even for the fourth estate i would request that when these unfortunate things happen don't don't let them blow up because there's so see, much more at let stake me tell Patrick. You, because you have two in fact the issues on the judiciary are started long ago i remember when justice james ogola Mm. called the storming of the of the high court i think 206 or yeah, 201 with the black mamba, the black mamba. Yes. and he referred to it as the rape the rape of I was the a young lawyer yes, i actually the, the, i actually, sat I actually thought you had not even started no i, 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 I I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> i wore i think i had just got I, I i we wore gowns and we went to court and yes. we sat down yes. i remember that you remember that yes. and, and 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 also a reporter and yes. and and you know when they stormed the, the high the court. temple of justice the temple of justice yes. do, do you think since then some people have ceased to look at these courts like the citadel <laughs> of honor and justice and that's because my struggle patrick that we need to fight for that because if we do not have just if we do not believe that they're the temple of justice then what where will the moon to our one see go what should they do and and these are the most highly educated people in the country. So these are the most resourced people in the country right now. So what we want to see is the preservation of that or, 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 or the, the recovery. <laughs> we need to go back to that place where the judiciary is seen as the temple of justice. And I think we've tried to, to, to get there. The judiciary is trying to, you know, rebuild their image. They're trying, the Judiciary Administration Act for me is a big way of trying to get them to be financially independent, um, which will also make their, you know, decisions independent. We've been talking about how judges are recruited. We want to see that that process also become more transparent and um, more independent of the other arms of government. It's a long journey, Patrick. Okay. And I think that we all have a role to play in it. And I appreciate the fourth estate for always bringing out these issues, but I wish that they would bring out these issues in a way of where can we go from here. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me also re um, refresh your mind again. Yeah. You talked of <laughs> reviving the law society. Yeah. So we just want to see on that <laughs> journey how did you revive the Royal Patrick, Society? This, this is, is very this dangerous. Is, this is Fiona I feel like I'm on trial at the beginning here. <laughs> of, her, of her reign. First of all, I think one of the things that has happened is that people have divided us. Our work has divided us. We need to come together 
Our work is very integral to the development of this country in all aspects, not just the rule of law. We are supposed to be advisors on government. Uh, we are corporation secretaries and we run very key uh, operational areas within the key institutions in this country. But we are not working together. We're not working with a strategy as members of the law society. We have to come together. We're starting a new strategic plan starting next year. And that is what I want to base this on. We, want, we need to ensure that we are faithful to our mandate, to, to, that every lawyer, wherever they are, remembers that rule of law is a priority. Because if we, if we tolerate uh, any injustices anywhere, it will threaten justice anywhere. The war fell flat because clearly on that mandate, yeah. I mean, there's a lot you could have done. Always. There's always a lot you can do, Patrick. Uh, but I want to say this. The rule of law has not been entrenched in this country. I did not promise to entrench the rule of the law. Rule of law. <laughs> <laughs> the rule of law. But but I'll say something. I, um, I like the way how you're trying to edit your words now. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, they were clear. There's a gentleman. Uh, there, are things, there are things you need to understand. One of the things I was talking about there was was the divisions within our society that was causing us to undermine the work of the law society. As I speak, every committee, we have 15, we have 20 committees of the law society that are committees of council, they are, de they are delegated uh, committees. These are 20 of them, each have, each have uh, about uh, 20 people on them. Then we have uh, delegated, we have clusters, mm -hmm. practice clusters, and those are 35. And each of these clusters now has members of the law society from government institutions, from uh, the corporate world, the, uh, from the civil society and uh, academia, and now even from private practice. For me, what that means is that we have brought everybody to participate in the governance of the society. When you do the numbers, you find that that's about 400 people contributing to the governance of the society, contributing to the um, to the advocacy of the society. That's why we're talking about numbers of about 150 people showing up for Nicholas, about 60 people showing up for um, Ambrose Tebiasa, that is that many lawyers showing you know, up for you the can, rule of law. You can law. have 400 people showing up for, um, for, for, for Nicholas and maybe 50 people showing up for, for Ambrose Tebiasa, but Omuntu Awansi, that's a word you like so much. That, that, yes. like so much. That, that, that person at the law level whose rights are being violated by the same government that's supposed to be protecting them, they have not gotten the protection they would have gotten from I, you. I wouldn't or you, agree or your with torch that. has not shown so much light on those issues. I wouldn't agree with that because our project, the legal aid project, uh, we've represented in the last year, we've represented about, uh, the last two years, we've represented about 65,000 Ugandans. I told you about the people that were able to rescue, 103 of them. I told you about the, uh, we have had two pro bono days and on each of these days we were able to represent, uh, in the year before we were able to represent 3,000 clients on just one day because we had about 1,500 lawyers turning out. Okay. We have that many people that are turning out for the moon to our one c Patrick, I think that's empirical evidence. You, you should you check know, our website okay, for the pictures. One of the things that I wanted to ask you, Diana, sorry, Fiona Wall, yeah. to respond to is uh, reviving the law society. But right now, there are people who think that uh, you actually moved away from uh, protecting the oh, rights yeah. <laughs> and, you, and you're more into building the corporate body of the organization. Yes, uh, there's a building that has been built but yeah. most important is for you to look into matters that affect the people not just the, uh, you the um, brick and mortar so next so can i explain why we headed there yes in covid much as there were the you see rule of law is not only in matters dealing with uh, security or the loss of life or torture uh, rule of law also looks at governance, good governance. In COVID, at the beginning of COVID, uh, there was money that was given and about 500 million was stolen from the Prime Minister's office, if you remember that. We had, uh, at the opening of the lockdown, we had uh, non-tariff barriers that had our sugar stuck. Uh, nobody could take our sugar because, you know, there were non-tariff barriers. 
farmers in Uganda were pouring 10,000 liters of milk daily. As, as Uganda Law Society, we offered, we made an, um, um, a memorandum of cooperation with the private sector and we said we need to help the Muntuwawansi whose milk is being poured daily because there's no market, because there's been, the market has been blocked, and yet we are saying we're doing regionalization. Okay. In, we, na, so when na, we Fiona, realized that, Fiona, let me finish, Madam, Patrick. Madam President, Madam let President, me I, want, I want to bring so to your attention. So this was about economic, the economic <laughs> rights of the Ugandan people at a time when... Um, um, when our finances were dire, when our economic existence was, let me tell you, there's nothing that breaks or impedes the development of the rule of law like poverty. And we needed to help the Ugandan people because their basic human rights when it came to their social, sorry, to their, to their economic rights were being infringed on and nobody was speaking for them. All right. So that's All right. what oh, we've oh, been oh, doing oh. as Uganda law. Okay, Fiona, society. Fiona, let me, let, me, let me bring in views of Ugandans who, who have watched you for the last two years as president <laughs> of Uganda Law Society what they think and uh, I'm going with Emmanuel Sanyo Safali who is based in Seguku he says we appreciate your dedication and service in this a tough time yes even uh, even us non-lawyers appreciate your role as uganda law society president what well, question do you think you have left the uls members more united than you found it especially around um uh, well I, I did not come especially around the area of rule of law and professionalism yes i believe so I believe so, and uh, I think we've just more than united. As I speak, uh, Patrick, even government lawyers and uh, the attorney general's chambers and the military lawyers and have now started paying membership and becoming more active in the law society. Okay. That's why during my term we had a phenomenal growth of about 1,200 lawyers in just two years. All right. Uh, let me also pick from uh, Ochola James. He says, um, frankly, the law society has been a suit and tie from forum with no actionable steps taken on promotion of human rights and advocacy right from the reign of past immediate president to the outgoing one and he's even crying mm. <laughs> and uh, let me also try to, to give you uh, one more uh, Robert Okello uh, he says I love the way how she packages her statements very knowledgeable and confident uh, Robert Okello there uh, is is uh, is happy with you, uh, uh, Ingrid Zuliaika says enforcement and implementation will only work if we have uh, patriotic, if we are patriotic and not uh, and not tribal, you, you know. And uh, Muhumu Zadismas asks LDC to value money. The cost now is six million minus other minor payments, and then they fail a person because of two papers of 48%. I think you need to reply to that before <laughs> I pick. It's in almost Joe Balava says, wonderful quote, Leader leadership is like alcohol. Sometimes it brings out the worst and the best out of you. Thank you, Wall. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, isn't it? And uh, maybe just the other week, the Chief Justice himself was in the news, helpless and appealing for respect of court orders. Yes. That's a man whose court possesses immense constitutional power to enforce orders. But even he, he sounds frustrated. Now imagine us, the downtrodden. Mm -hmm. Things are bad, and Fiona Wall of this world just live in denial and pat themselves on the back. Thank you for the show anyway. Best <laughs> Joseph Burite. What, what, what do you tell them? You know, Patrick, I don't believe in lying down and crying and saying, oh, war unto us, we're finished, we have nothing to do about this. I believe that um, just, you know, the way uh, a woodworm works at a, what, what uh, eats up wood, um, a woodworm is never seen when it's eating up a piece of wood, like this chair that you're seated on. If a woodworm were to work on this chair, you would not see it work. But one day you're going to sit on that chair and it will crumble into dust. And I think that the best way to work on things like corruption and is to continue working at them, is to continue addressing them, is to continue speaking of them, is to continue uh, making statements. And I think if anyone uh, Googles the Law Society, you'll see the numerous ways in which we have voiced our dis dis discomfort, our dissatisfaction with the administration of justice, especially uh, 
the access to justice. You've seen us uh, 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 advocating and, and, and crying out for the legal aid bill to be passed. It's, it's embarrassing that up to now, the government of Uganda is releasing a certificate of financial implications at zero. Okay. They do not want to put a but penny there. So, but should we then say, should we give up? Is that is that not living? I think that is living in denial. We need justice, and okay. if if anything is worth it, you've got to fight for it. There are two things I saw, perhaps yes. um, because the government wanted to introduce the idea that there should be no bail should not be oh, given. Yeah. And, uh, and 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 probably <laughs> probably there is coward. <laughs> <laughs> and and and, uh, and I remember hearing the voice of Uganda Law Society on the on the on the coffee yeah. uh, where they wanted uh, one person take the, yeah the, the, so we the had powers to be able to, to yeah to buy so an export. his excellency was very unhappy with uh, the fact that he said that uh, people did not understand why people would uh, be suspected of murder and then the next day they're walking and, and he was also talking about corruption, where, where people that deserve bail are not getting it and people that don't deserve it are getting it. And based on this conclusion, he stated that he wanted uh, bail removed. So the Law Society, we knew that there was a lot at stake and we started advocating uh, ardently for this. We went a step further, we worked with the judiciary and uh, we want to thank the judiciary that they came up with guidelines to sort of close those loopholes. And I know people will say those guidelines will not cure things right now, but I know that they have helped a lot. And what that does, and how do we see success? Uh, after those efforts, after having a, we actually launched a prison decongestion project because the Uganda Law Society was able to demonstrate that there are about, uh, they're about um, 3,000 uh, we have 55,000 prisoners, 60, 65,000 prisoners. Of those, 35,000 are on remand. Of those, about 15,000 have been on remand longer than when than the period they should be sentenced. When we demonstrated this, what? yes, <laughs> and they are in prison for our prison capacity right now is 317 uh, percent. Do you understand? Yeah. 317. Has gone twice, uh, almost three times more. No, 300 times. Oh, yes. 317 <laughs> times. Yeah, so that's the capacity of our prison. So we're like, we, we said, if this is the situation, how do you remove the, the option of bail? But also, how do you remove the option of bail and still preserve the prerogative of uh, this innocence until uh, anyway, guilty? Anyway, I don't know, if, I don't so, know whether so there would be anybody who would support that because it can come back to bite you. Exactly. So we, we, the next we, day. I want to applaud Parliament of Uganda because what we did, we also, you know, talked to Parliament, released a statement that... Uh, I think after a while, all these combined efforts from the judiciary, from parliament, from us, uh, we were able to hear the president in January 31st, that's my birthday, they were launching the rule of uh, the opening of the, he said, I'm finally satisfied that we do not need to touch the constitution on bail. For me, that was a huge victory. The second one, you mentioned coffee. For me, um, and, and, and Patrick, for me, this argues uh, my point on the economic rights of Ugandans not being talked about, not being looked into, because this was a serious issue. The Uganda Law Society's advisory role includes going to parliament and informing. So we were invited for a legal opinion on the coffee, the Vinci Coffee Agreement. We found out that this was actually the fourth addendum. So this was the fourth amendment to the agreement. We went back and dug all the other uh, and, and, and then we you know, were able to give a legal opinion that recommended that this be um, cancelled or, uh, yeah, be cancelled actually, because it was very unconscionable for the Ugandan people. It was against everything that government had been doing for the past years in promoting agriculture, promoting coffee, promoting development, and it seemed to be um, even going against all the existing laws. So was this so cancelled? Was it? Yes, it or was. It was just paused, or has it died really? It was cancelled. Because there are some people, some people who still think. At least I'm like, glad. Like, like the Egyptian phoenix, it can actually rise from the ashes. 
Well, allow me to say, and allow me to use this opportunity to thank uh, the, ch the chair of the, of the committee that took our recommendations, uh, Honorable Mwine Mpaka, and, and all the parliamentarians that supported this, the Speaker of Parliament, because they were able to take us, ours and other people's recommendations and cancel this and cause uh, the people that crafted it to revisit uh, such things in future. I think it set the right tone uh, on what role parliament should play when it comes to government uh, institu instruments and, and, and okay. post, uh, sorry and agreements that commit the Ugandan people. But that, Patrick, is something that you can only be good at if you also visit the economic rights of people. So it's not that we're turning uh, Uganda Law Society into a co it's already a corporate organization, mind you, but it's, 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 its mandate is beyond uh, just uh, issues of torture, issues of, I'm not saying they're not important, they're absolutely important, but we also need to remember that the people of Uganda need to eat and we have to fight every time someone li looks like they're taking the food out of our Ugandan mouth. So th there have been times when you've, you've hosted, you've uh, hosted the president, I think, uh, when he comes to your, he came to your, to your function? Uh, no, I, he has, he, he, it was the honorable minister, but we visited the his Excellency. Yes, you he went to, us. with all the lawyers from East Africa. Yes. Oh, yeah. that that time we hosted him. Yes, that, yes. Uh, that's the one I mean. That's yes. the one I mean. Yeah. So, um, you know, you had an opportunity to engage at least on one on one. Did you do that? Yes, uh, we actually went to visit him in Nakasero during my term. The the, the 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 visit you're talking about was when I was v when I was secretary. Yes. That's long ago. But when 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 we went to his place. Um, in Entebbe, it was actually Entebbe, um, I, I went with many asks and I think we came back with very good uh, results. The first one was our concern that uh, the government of Uganda did not seem to want to put any money to legal aid and he did commit that the government of Uganda would put money to legal aid because we raised the issue that DGF had been closed up for a year you know, and and it's it's actually a whole pro bono project is funded was funded by DGF. But if you can pause there, because I have an interest in DGF, so it's probably even even Human Rights Commission. <laughs> everybody has an interest pro in DGF. Probably it is supposed yeah. to be stopping around this this this. It's stopping, uh, so that's going to cause a big gig gap. So we did tell him about. This I wonder what's going to happen because the moment they if they pack up and go which is the most likely event that yes, they will, yes. there's going to be a huge gap. Left. No, there's already a huge gap, Patrick, because things have been suspended for two so, years. Yeah. So there's a lot that we could not do. There's a lot that many institutions, including the almost all the governance institutions that belong to government. How can you bite the hand do? that feeds you? Um, so <laughs> well, but at least I was telling you, so one of, that was the one thing that he uh, pledged to do, and we're trying to follow that up with a new Minister of Justice, who we are excited about. Uh, the second thing that uh, we talked about was the issue of advice. And we raised, and I think for me, the coffee agreement is one of those. We said, okay. we said there's an institution, uh, the Attorney General's Office, that advises government, but many times they're overwhelmed worked, they have too much work, and yet our mandate as Uganda Law Society is to advise government. So we offered our our advice. We said we have uh, 35 clusters, different practice areas, oil and gas, etc. And these clusters you went with your wish list, advice. You? Yes. So we said we are, we are willing to advise government free of charge. It is our mandate. So use us. Um, he pledged to do that. We're still waiting for our matching orders. Well, uh, well, and there were so many other things that okay. we asked for. But I, I think for me those two um, were the two now that you Now that, that you have, towards the, we're coming the end of the, our discussion tonight and mm -hmm. uh, you talked about the new uh, Minister <laughs> of Justice and Constitutional Affairs, the Honorable yes. Norbert Mao. Yeah. And uh, I, I was reading somewhere that, that um, he is quoted to have said that maybe Uganda should go uh, parliamentary democracy and uh, as opposed to, to universal adult suffrage wow. in, in electing a president. Uh, do you think that could be his brief? <laughs> um, first of all, Patrick, you've not said for real whether he said it or it whether it yeah, was it, said that it he was said it. That, uh, I do not think I want to address myself to <laughs> that. I really would not. I, that would be presumptuous of me. But what I'll say about Honorable Mao is he's on record on issues of rule of law. He is on record on matters. And we've, 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 we've interacted with him twice since he became minister. And... Uh, 
the reason we are excited is this man has been in the trenches with the law society he was a member of staff of the of the of the clinics the legal aid clinics uh, before when he was beginning his career he has been he was a member of um so many of our committees he was a champ he's been a champion of rule of law right. he has helped us a lot okay. when it comes to advocacy and one of the things he said at the rule of law sorry at the annual law conference where he was our guest was that he is the same person well, so we're excited that for the first time we have a lawyer, okay, you are you're hopeful. Us. Okay, yeah. I just want to let me conclude with Helen Mojuni, mm -hmm. who says, "Is LDC survival for the fittest?" With this economy, please help us, the students, understand what's going on. Six million. LDC, um, we've had many things. Every time there's something different. I think you saw the colossal failures uh, last year in the previous, and uh, we talked a lot about this. We broke it down. Um, we caused people to sit, and I want to thank LDC, the LDC management. One of the reasons, of course, they had such problems was because they had to go online because these students had gone through a COVID, COVID year, and the failures were coming from that. And, but there are also system issues. But this year, they've just graduated, and uh, about 70% of the people who failed last time have passed. And then we have we had a very high pass rate compared to to what we had at the beginning. And for me, that was result in itself that something is going well. Okay. And now the issue is the fees. So. The fees is something that has to be addressed again through a system of because we do, I, I cannot sit here and talk about fees. I do not know what informs those fees, but there's a lot that is going on right now. Conversations around what should LDC look like. The bar, the bar course in other countries, like in the United States, is a bar course. The failure rate can be very high. They don't care whether you fail or pass. Nobody gets called out. You come, you register, you do the bar, you don't study. I think the problem that came out with the LDC is that you have this whole nine months of teaching. But it's not supposed to be teaching. It's supposed to be uh, instructing you and training you to do practical application of the law. So you better have good content from the university. We have 12 universities that are, uh, are producing law students. These 12 universities have about 1,000 students each. All of them going to LDC? Imagine. All of them supposedly supposed to go to LDC. LDC's capacity is only 1,500 right now. And now... The, the quality, we do not know the quality that's coming from these universities because I know some universities that are using lecturers, some lecturers in those universities that are teaching in more than two universities. So you, there's a question of quality even down there. Now LDC, those nine months assume that you have the content. So there are many problems and I think this is already being discussed at different levels to see do we need to teach at LDC? Shouldn't we just have a bar course with, where people register, sit and go? Because in the US you can even sit for that bar exam as many as four times and, and, and still go on. Yet at LDC, uh, there's moments where you're told you've completely failed, you know. So this is not going to be a conversation of one day. And I'm very glad that everybody that is involved right now is, is seriously looking at this because we do care about legal ed education here. All right. I want to thank you so much um, for your time. And uh, you've added value to our understanding of can the I, can I Can, can I send Burango and say thank you? Uh, yeah, okay, an announcement. Can I bill you? <laughs> you can bill me. <laughs> no, no, I just want to say thank you to the Ugandan people. Um, everywhere that we've needed, especially our stakeholders, the JLO stakeholders, I want to thank the judiciary. Uh, I want to thank the Chief Justice and his top management. They've been very supportive. Uh, we introduced electri They introduced electronic case management. It's yeah. been a trial, but they've been very helpful in trying to make sure everybody's on game with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to thank uh, 
um, I'm also very proud that I got to to serve with them under the Judiciary Administration Act. I think that was very special. I want to thank the DPP. I want to thank uh, our, our, our other 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 JLOS partners that have been with us. I want to thank the Uganda Law Society Council that has served with me. Those great women and men, Patrick, and uh, the past presidents. They've been very supportive. Our committees and our committee chairs and clusters and again our partners we've had PSFU we've had the Kingdom of Buganda that gave us three uh, trade centers or legal centers for for, for uh, business issues we've had um, other partners uh, like uh, crane management services there's a time our lawyers didn't have accommodation I just want to thank everybody that has lent a hand to the law society I can't thank the fourth estate enough thank you okay. thank you all right so who's gonna be as I say goodbye who, who's, who, who's going to be to step in your shoes uh, the people the people's rather, who, choice. who would you rather uh, have uh, I think I just Carole want a leader that will keep that will grow will continue to grow the voice of the law society it has to be a courageous voice it has to be a, a neutral voice because it serves many many interests and it has to be um, a voice that is ethical I think there's a that is very that is very necessary. That sounds like a Diana mandate. There's ah. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, what how do they call it? Uh, no, for <laughs> me, I, I think that uh, we need the leader of the law society to to continue. Um, you know the things that is, is we it illegal? did in is it my illegal? time. Is it illegal yeah. for the outgoing president to say this is my preference? No, it's just my principle that I allow the law society to decide. Uh, I think that I want to tell you that most of the candidates have actually been part of my my success. All right. They've actually been working with me. So I, right now I'm very conflicted. I might actually not vote on Saturday, unfortunately. But what I want to say is that I and my council have stood on the shoulders of gi giants. For the past 67 years, people have consistently sacrificed for the law society to get where it is now. We need leadership that will take us to another level and build on that. Okay. Not, not to just, uh, you know. So where do yeah. we go from here? Where do we go from here? I promised a uh, law society that was faithful to its mandate, that was available to the Muntua 1C, that was teachable in its reputation. I pr I pray that the Uganda Law Society votes in a leader that will take that to another level. Where do you go from here? Where do I go from here? I am very grateful. I'll probably need to take a breather, but I am still a public servant in National Water and Sewage Corporation. Uh, I started a leadership institute that I'm very passionate about to raise ethical leaders and a faithful, available, teachable. That's the one big inspiration I got out of being president. And I'm hoping that that will be something I'll do for the rest of my life. And after all, you're senior counsel now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, that <laughs> has to be, I think, formalized. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, Fiona. Navasa War. Thank you so much thank for your time. You. And for those of you who have been a part of this uh, discussion, have been watching it, I want to thank you for the privilege of your great company. Good night <laughs> and God bless you, Gandhi.